So, I woke up one day, and aside from a dire need to use the toilet desperately, a single thought was on my mind. Damn, I really wish I knew more about hobnobs and just biscuits in general. Like, where did they come from and why are they so delicious? A cold sweat came over me while the reality set in that I may not be alone in this crisis, and there could be others out there who also face this looming existential level question of not knowing where hobnobs came from. After this experience, I decided to do some research of my own into Hobnobs and the company that makes them, McFitties. With this video, I hope that my findings, which I will share with you all, are able to put any anxieties you may have to rest, and I can give you some comfort so that you can enjoy a peaceful, Hobnob knowledge filled sleep tonight. For the initiated, a biscuit is a small baked unleavened cake that is typically crisp, flat and sweet. In America, the word has a completely different meaning, but that doesn't really matter here, does it? The old French word besquite is derived from the Latin words bis, meaning twice, and coquer, coctus, to cook. So basically it means that they were twice cooked. Another variation is the Dutch term besquite, if I'm pronouncing that right, which is a circular and brittle grain product usually covered by a savoury or sweet topping and eaten at breakfast. The more you know. Let us go back to the year 1809. The Napoleonic Wars were still raging, the Boyd Massacre occurred in New Zealand, and Ecuador declared independence from Spain. A few people of note were born this year, such as Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln, along with the focus of this retrospective, Robert McVitie. Robert was born in Dumfries, Scotland, and served as an apprentice baker when he grew up a bit. In the 30s, the 1830s and not the 1930s, he moved to Edinburgh with his father William and opened up what was then known as a provision shop on Rose Street. Robert's baking skills earned him a positive reputation, and he was able to expand his business across multiple shops and sites of production. During the years that followed, Robert had moved his business to Charlotte Place, London Street, Broughton Street, and Leith Walk. By the 40s, Robert McVitie had married and sired two sons, William and Robert Jr. Realising that baking was truly his future, he sent his sons to Europe to study the art of mechanical engineering and aerospace. Nah, just kidding, they trained to be bakers as well. In 1875, the McVitie family was partnered with former Cadbury salesman named Charles Edward Price, who helped them expand their biscuit empire even further. Price's role in helping the McVitie family to grow was so important that his name was even incorporated into the brand, and as a result, it fish took the name of McVitie and Price. In the 1880s, Robert McVitie Sr. passed away, leaving his legacy to Robert Jr. As the popularity of their product grew more and more, the demand was increasing far beyond their current capabilities, and as a result, McVitie's and Price moved to a new premises at St Andrew's Biscuit Works. If you were to go there now, you'd see a nice block of flats. Isn't that nice? Up until this point, the company had primarily been focused on producing bread and cakes, but due to the longer lifespan of biscuits, that was a far more lucrative business opportunity. That was where they would next direct their attention. During this time, a fellow by the name of Alexandra Grant joined the company who would prove to be incredibly influential in coming up with quite possibly one of the greatest achievements in human history ever. After four years of working for McVitie's and Price, Mr Grant concocted the recipe for the perfect digestive biscuit. Though it had supposedly been first conceived some years prior by a pair of doctors, it is thought that Grant merely expanded upon the original design. The name comes from one of the key ingredients, that being baking soda, which was said to ease indigestion. Even though this was later put under heavy scepticism, the name stuck and digestive biscuits are still enjoyed by millions today. McVitie's was bestowed with an incredible opportunity in 1893, being commissioned by none other than the royal family of Britain. The wedding of the future King George and his wife Queen Mary was in dire need of a cake, and there was only one baker who fit the bill. At over 2 metres high and costing 140 guineas, which is a lot by the way, the McVitie's royal cake was a sight to behold. History would later go on to repeat itself twice, as McVitie's was once again commissioned with the crafting the official cake of Elizabeth and Philip's wedding in 1947, and William and Kate in 2011. This event gained McVitie's and Price a massive boost in recognition, and its products would even be used as nutrition and belly fillers during Arctic expeditions. In 1894, the Edinburgh factory was destroyed in a fire, and the company had to move to another temporary premises while reconstruction took place. In 1902, the business had grown beyond Scotland, and a huge new factory was built in Harleston, North London, which is still there to this day. Such a site is no doubt a holy pilgrimage spot to devout followers of the Biscuit Way. 
Robert McVitie Jr. died eight years later in 1910, leaving no heirs, but before his death, he had turned the business into a limited company with Alexander Grant at the helm. With the outbreak of World War I in 1914, McVitie was pressed into action, supplying biscuits to be used in emergency iron rations. These iron rations were to be consumed in the event of a soldier's regular supply of food being cut off, and these often made the difference in a life or death situation. In the 1920s, the company was embroiled in a political scandal when Alexandra Grant was suspected of being involved with the bribing of the Labour Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. Grant had supplied MacDonald an expensive car and a number of share of and in return he had been granted a baronetcy. No doubt such a scandal today would have been all over Twitter and the Daily Mail. In 1925, McVitie's made a scientific breakthrough. What if he took a digestive and put chocolate on it? What should we call you? It was originally known as the chocolate home wheat digestive, but at some point they must have decided that a mouthful of biscuit was better than a mouthful of words. So it was shortened to just chocolate digestive. Two years later, another breakthrough was made with the development of Jaffa Cakes. Taking its name from the Jaffa Orange, Jaffa Cakes consisted of a Genoa sponge base, a layer of orange flavoured jam, and a coating of chocolate. McVitie's faced an uphill battle with Jaffa Cakes, since the customs law tried to state that they were actually biscuits and subject to VAT. Not wanting to simply roll over and give in, McVitie's fought back and maintained their stance that it was in fact a cake and achieved success. Gotta be honest, McVitie's were pretty blunt with the naming of their products, but they must have done something right. In 1948, McVitie and Price merged with McFarlane Lang & Company to form the United Biscuits Group, which is still in business today, selling products under the McVitie's brand we all know and dunk. McVitie's has produced many well-known household staples which usually end up in a kid's lunchbox one way or another. Penguin bars, cheddars, mini cheddars, rich teas and loads more. Perhaps the greatest invention came in 1985, when the stars aligned and a holy light shone down from the heavens upon the earth and blessed us with the hobnob, invented by Julian Pike, who sold the formula to McVitie's. They were crafted with a mixture of jumbo oats, rolled oats, and probably a load of hopes and dreams as well. Two years later in 1987, a chocolate variety was introduced, which coincidentally was the same year that Metal Gear and Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up were first released. No connection but I just thought it was worth mentioning anyway, because these three things sort of shaped human life as we know it. Time for some fun facts. The original tagline of Hobnobs was, One nibble and you're nobbled. But it was later removed and even later made a resurgence with some alteration as, One nibble and you're hobnobbled. It doesn't roll off the tongue as well. In 2009, the digestive was ranked the fourth most popular biscuit for dunking in tea among the British public, with first place going to his chocolate cousin. The UK alone consumes 70 digestives a second, totalling at 6 million a day. In comparison, Girls Aloud only sold 4 million albums throughout their entire career. Imagine being less popular than a biscuit. The name Hobnob comes from the verb to hobnob, meaning to mix socially, generally with people of a higher class. Therefore, for example, people hobnob over tea or a biscuit, in like a little uh, afternoon tea kind of way but nobody's really used a phrase like that for over 200 years, probably. Digestive biscuits are known to have caused an argument between the Beatles during a recording session of Abbey Road. While George Harrison and John Lennon were recording a song, John Lennon's wife, Yoko Ono, was in the recording studio and sneakily nabbed a few cheeky biscuits from Harrison's box. Harrison lost his rag at the theft, and this outburst caused Lennon to lose his temper in response. So that pretty much covers the story of McVitie's. Obviously I didn't cover everything like what Robert McVitie's cat was named or every single address he'd worked at, but I, I hope I was able to provide some insight into the tale of probably the UK's favourite biscuit broker. I hope you enjoyed this video, and it was just a bit of fun that came from a random inspiration one afternoon, and if the feedback is good, I'd be happy to make some more. Thank you for watching.